Well, today is April 14th of 2017, and I am interviewing David Nunes in Taylorville, Illinois. David is 46 years old, having been born on December 23rd of 1970. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. So David, for the recording, would you please state what branch of service that you served? I was in the United States Army. All right. So let's start with um, when and where you were born, and if you could tell us a little bit about that, and uh, maybe your parents and your siblings. Okay. I was born in uh, Jacksonville, Illinois. I was born a premature baby at that time, but managed to survive. <laughs> and so I've always had that, you know, trying to start off, you know, where I had to survive, and that's how I used towards my military experience. Mm -hmm. I had a grandfather that was in the Army during World War II, and the other one that tried to serve during World War II. And so my experience with the Army, I've always been there, mm -hmm. you know, just sitting on his lap and hearing about the stories of what he went through and stuff has always, you know, it helped me to understand more about what's going on and just the honor of serving your country mm -hmm. was always there. Um, my family mostly was in Jacksonville now, but they have uh, have a few moved over to Quincy or somewhere up north mm -hmm. and stuff near the Chicago area. They're kind of all moved around now. but. Uh, and so, what about your parents? What what did um, uh, what were their um, occupations? Okay. Well, my dad right now is currently retired, and my stepdad is um, right now working as an electrician. Last I knew, part time. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother's working at um, a financial loan company, mm -hmm. and where my stepmother is working as a nurse and stuff. Okay. Any siblings? Yes, I have uh, several brothers and sisters, but I'm the oldest one at the time. But, yeah, uh, they're all pretty busy working in so many different areas, <laughs> it's hard to keep up. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, um, it sounds like your, possibly your grandfather probably inspired you a little bit yes. to go toward the service. So what were you doing right before, um, like before you join the service and what um, what was the thought and how, how that worked getting into the service? It was in 1990, I was just graduating from high school, but I was really trying to think about what I really wanted to do in my future. Mm -hmm. I had just signed up for to go to DeVry uh, College, but mm -hmm. saw the, the amount of finances it would take to go, mm -hmm. getting realistic about whether I was mature enough, I felt, mm -hmm. to make it through school. And I was like, I just wanted to serve my country, I think, and grow up a little more, I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> before I went to school. And so in 1990, I turned around, and I think right after I graduated in June, I went into the recruiter. At the time, the Marines said that they couldn't, well, first I went to Marines because they, uh, my stepdad, uh, inspired me at the time for being serving in Vietnam in the Marines. But they wouldn't accept me because they said I had too much of problems health-wise, asthma-wise. Mm -hmm. But I went in the Army and walked right in and just gave them the easiest thing the recruiter to do is said, I want to sign up. <laughs> and it wasn't like he had to talk me into it. Well, he started looking down about where I had asthma or anything like that too. But he actually saw how I was running and bicycling, trying to overcome that. Mm -hmm. I was running three or four miles at a good full pace, mm -hmm. no asthma attacks. Mm -hmm. I was running 11 miles with very little a mild cases of asthma mm -hmm. and stuff. So, oh, and he saw I was bicycling everywhere I go for exercise. And he had a hard time keeping up with me to <laughs> catch up to me, to talk to me at a time mm -hmm. when I was on the bicycle because I was usually pretty good at moving pretty quick. Mm -hmm. But he was able to help me get in and stuff like that mm -hmm. because I was showing a mild case and never had any real hard issues with asthma. So I was able to go in. But of course, Desert Storm kicked off in the middle of the summer. I was in a delay entry program going in November the 20th in 1990 is when I was finally went to basic. And that's when Desert Shield was still going on. And then as soon as I went in that basic, it was Desert Storm. 
and during that whole time it was a quiet experience going through basic AIT not knowing whether I was going overseas or not mm -hmm. for war situation. How did you feel when you first uh, went into basic? Was it like a, uh, well just how did you feel? Uh, first going in it was terrifying to me a bit, you know, I was barely met the minimum weight standard going in. I was six foot tall, 115 pounds. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely see now that's no big deal now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I had, they shaved my head, I'll never forget that, looking into the, can to the mirror and thinking, wow, I look like a refugee that's been in a concentration camp or something. <laughs> I was pretty narrow and skinny and everything, and the head shaved, it, it was frightening. <laughs> but I pushed myself through it and carried on. <laughs> so while you were in BASIC, um, uh, what was your most memorable moment? Uh, there was a, one time like in the middle of a PT doing sit-ups and stuff like that, and I had a drill sergeant kind of come up and just take a step while me, use me as a step to step over <laughs> as I was doing it. Of course, my muscles were tightened up by then, and <laughs> he could do that and stuff. But also, just doing what we call like grass drills, or it depends on the weather outside, they'd be called snow drills. And there you're brought outside for some kind of, it could be like a just a made up discipline thing, or it could be just, well, there was something actually, someone got caught with candy or something like that when they shouldn't have had. And we were out doing these where you're standing in one place and he says go and you're supposed to be running in place. And then we say stop, you're supposed to drop to a push up position. And you'll say row left or row right. And you row to that position, you row to that other position to a push up position. Or you'll say back, you know, where you get up to a sit up crunch position. And he said go. And well, he would continually go on for hours doing that. <laughs> and continually you're doing this, moving back and forth. And I remember one time being out in the snow doing that and coming back in and everybody's so hot and warm. It was cold outside, but everybody was hot. And you could see steam coming off our cotton sweatsuits, you know, just uh -huh. from the snow and being all wet, mm -hmm. <laughs> melting. Mm -hmm. And it was something. <laughs> Carry on. Did, um, did you make friendships in BASIC that, yes. that lasted? Uh, for a, for a bit till we got transferred to our main party, mm -hmm. but there was so many different types of characters there. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. You had one guy who was in a car accident, so he had one eye higher than the other, and it looked like his face was reconstructed, mm -hmm. you know, back together. And he couldn't walk a couple of feet on ice. And this was at Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. And during the winter time in November through May and every step on ice he'd fall mm -hmm. but when he fell he'd grab a hold of somebody else nearby and next you know you see a domino effect of everybody else falling in that group I remember always seeing that but never happened to be nearby so I was always laughing about him being able to fall like that and I and you know where pride comes before a fall well I was building that up I didn't say anything verbally but it was inside my heart that way and turn around, I remember going out to this live range where you have this obstacle course. And I'm sitting there watching them go through the obstacle course, just standing there on ice, a good balance, I thought. And next note, my feet flew up and I hit the ground on my back, knocked the air out of me. And that thought came to my mind of what I just said, <laughs> crept up to me. That, that was actually the first time I came to know the Lord at the time because I was so worried about whether I was going to die, where I was going to go, to heaven or to hell. And I started really searching the Bible and stuff like that. Everybody thought I was a Christian already because I was doing that so much. And as, but as I found, you know, through like a, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell that to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, I went into an empty room and asked him into my life and never was the same after that. It was a milestone in my life when I saw the Lord come into my life and it wasn't so much like a religious ceremony because I was in an empty room with just me and God that it made it more personal and it helped me get through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I have to learn to be honest with myself before God more. And it's always been that milestone when I forget 
when I forget to be honest with myself and come before God, that I remember that. I remember that day. And that affected the rest of your career then? Yes, yes, because yeah, unfortunately, you know, I was that compromise you know, where you want to be too much like everybody else, or you compromise in your mindset, and you become back to your flesh, you know, if we would say Christian-wise. Mm -hmm. You become back to your own way of old thinking, because mm -hmm. of that old nature is still there. Without the help of God, the transferring to equip you to strengthen you, mm -hmm. because you're relying on your own nature and your own self, mm -hmm. that you'll find that you'll compromise. You'll make up excuses for what you're doing. And so when you go back to the Lord and you return back to that reality of what's truth is, then God gives you the grace to transform you to do what's right. Mm -hmm. And it helps you when you're in the military or throughout life mm -hmm. to finally, you know, go back to that you need to rely on God daily. Mm -hmm. And just to see, you know, just to make it through the day, just to make it through and do what's right. Mm -hmm. Because if you find yourself just following like a religious path where you're physically just trying to do, act like a Christian, like I've done so many times, you'll find you're very easily compromised and go your own way. But being real with God, having that realistic milestone of coming before God and having the effect of being truthful before God, it causes you to really look back at your own life and say, hey, you know, this is what I need to do. This is where I should have been. God sees all. He knows all. Why be a fake about it? <laughs> exactly. Um, so when you get toward the end of um, basic training, or at the end of basic training, I should say, um, you went on to AIT, and what yes. did you go to AIT for? I went through for a combat engineer. Okay. Um, we were were with 12 Charlies and 12, I was, we were 12 Bravos. Mm -hmm. And basically we were working on learning how to disassemble landmines or how to place landmines, how to spot them with metal detectors and uh, work with explosives, you know, because we were, anytime the obstacle came across, we were either remove the obstacle or mm -hmm. if we had to destroy something like a bridge or one side of the bridge, we had to learn how to do that too. And uh, as well as learning how to put together a quick bridge for people to get across. Mm -hmm. So our experience were a lot of times going along with the infantry and helping them out and always being the one called forward before they remove the obstacle before they attack mm -hmm. <laughs> or something. So it was quite interesting, it? especially the first time to see going on to um, demolition range for the first time. We've, I've seen a lot of guys' eyes with fear, you know, go out. It was all the new recruits with fear before a drill sergeant. This is the first time I got a chance to see fear in the eyes of the drill sergeants <laughs> as we were working with live explosives and demolition. <laughs> so it was always interesting to see the table turn. <laughs> are there any interesting um, stories from that AIT period that? Uh, during the grenade range, we had probably one time where a, a guy, it was probably happens every so often where the guy throws the wrong thing. You were taught to throw, you know, to take the ring out and then throw the grenade. Well, somehow they're so nervous that they forget and they throw the ring and <laughs> everything else and the grenade drops right in their pit where they are. And the recruiter and the drill sergeant has to grab the guy, throw him out of the pit and so the grenade would go off safely without them getting harmed. <laughs> And that happened, unfortunately, <laughs> before. Yeah. But it's interesting. <laughs> so, okay, so after AIT, then mm -hmm. where um, where were you stationed? I was stationed. Well, I went after AIT. I was supposed to be going to Fort Benning, Georgia, and for a jump school, what we call it, a parachute school. Mm -hmm. And I. We were getting close. My parents had picked me up to see me for one last time before, because they, because during Desert Storm we really weren't allowed to go on leave between basic and AIT. But that gave me a little chance to see my parents and stuff before I went to Fort Benning, Georgia. Well, as I came back, 
getting ready to get on a bus, supposedly with everybody else, to ride a bus all the way to Fort Benning, Georgia. They were actually filled up, so I didn't get a chance to go. So I ended up having to take a plane. But in the route on the way there, we got a bu that's the first time I ever got a chance to fly you know, on a plane. And unfortunately, we missed the plane ride there, so we had to take the next one in the morning. So we had to stay up all night at the airport waiting for the next flight mm -hmm. and went through this a bunch of small planes that seemed like going there because um, we hit some turbulence. And I'll never forget uh, the steward gave me a drink of soda and I was getting ready to take a drink and next snow and we hit turbulence and my whole drink went up in the air <laughs> out of the cup in midair <laughs> and then came down. <laughs> My first experience of flying is seeing a plane being tossed around, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, still made it through. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you get to Fort Benning. Right. And what was your job there? There, I uh, went through the school for you know jumping out of planes and mm -hmm. stuff, and I was very uncoordinated. You had several different weeks of schooling where you had to go through, in different phases. So I think three or four phases. Mm -hmm first phase was learning just to do parachute landing falls because the parachutes we used um, were not free falling parachutes where they'll slow you down where you can land on your feet. They were made to, like the impact of jumping off a 15 foot wall mm -hmm. impact so you had to do parachute landing falls, practice them and I was very uncoordinated, not much of a dancer so I could not seem to bend my body the right way like I posted you to do parachute landing fall for a, that whole couple weeks phase. Mm -hmm. And so I finally qualified through the first phase at the very last person <laughs> of my group. And they, each of us was given number and they were called by our number, not by our rank or name. And mine was 223. And I had to be reminded of that by the black hat who the instructor that was over our class. 223, if 223 can make it, anybody can make it. <laughs> I could truly hurt because he, he knew how to inspire me to push myself because even though he was saying that supposedly, you know, which would have insulted me, he knew that that would actually get me like, I got to show him. I got to <laughs> push myself. I'm going to make it. <laughs> and I made it through the, where they had to practice, where we got into a parachute landing, the next phase where we got into harness and we were swinging across, swung across a little bit about 10 feet up in the air. We were swung across and then released and we were supposed to practice the parachute landing fall. Mm -hmm. Made it through that with flying colors because I spent so much time trying to make it through the first phase doing parachute landing falls that I outperformed everybody else because I had more practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then got to a fit phase three where we were up in a uh, 25 foot tower and that's where you practice jumping out of a plane you know as you would go through the steps of being in the plane to hooking up and you're in this harness the mock-up harness and you're basically hooked up to a cable that slides down from that 25 foot area and slides all the way down safely you know to an area where you can release mm -hmm. But you're basically like in a harness and you're basically 25 feet jumping out to midair what you felt like you know and you're basically being caught by the harness and slid down well i found out i was afraid of heights <laughs> at that time so i was so nervous that i didn't know why i was so nervous i was messing up so much and we had such a hot head of a black head up there that as soon as you do one thing wrong he'll grab you and throw you out <laughs> and down the cable, you know, and didn't take long to follow you. My instructor, the one that was head of our class, pulled me aside and said, Airborne, are you afraid of heights? <laughs> and I started thinking, and it was the first time I've become reality of why I was so afraid. Mm -hmm. I said, I guess I am a <laughs> black hat instructor, you know? And he, so he, he sent me back again, but this time it was like I knew what the fear was. Mm -hmm. And now I could face it. Now it's going to be a little calmer and face it and get hooked up and go through it. And there I passed finally with flying colors through that. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it went through to phase four, which was uh, jumping out of planes, going through. You have five parachute jumps you have to do. 
first jump was very memorable because um, we're all getting ready to jump and I was sitting there thinking through the steps we're supposed to do, all the parachute landing fall up. From the jump on down, we had all the steps memorized. And I remember getting the first phase of people jumping out of the plane, there was this major there and he freaked out. He went from the back of the plane where the doors that we jump out of to Austin to the front of the plane and did, said, no, no, I'm not jumping. I'm not jumping. <laughs> He's freaking out. <laughs> but I got to jump out and I was thinking so hard about the steps that when it came my time that it took me a little bit to realize I just went out the plane because <laughs> I'm thinking so hard of those steps. And uh, when it came down to the ground where we slowed down and pulled out, our rides would slow down, I was right over a Humvee. <laughs> I was about ready to land on a Humvee. <laughs> but I just came up and my, grazed the hood of the Humvee. I went from the back of the Humvee to the front of the Humvee. My foot just touched the toes, just touched the hood, of the end of the hood. So I ended up landing on the ground, but it was unfortunately on a packed in road, but it wasn't so bad. <laughs> So my fifth jump was the scariest. That one, um, you know, thinking everything, it made everything out of our jump. You know, coming down to the ground, getting about 200 feet from the ground, pulling my risers to slow down. And the way you a lot of times check to, you know, I figured out how you figured out which way the wind's going so you could always pull the opposite risers to slow you down was by the way you're drifting. You looked at the trees and see which way you're drifting from them. Well, I saw the trees and I saw everything and I pulled the risers to slow down. And next to an instructor on the ground with a megaphone was yelling, pull the opposite risers, pull the opposite risers. I looked around, I was like, is he talking to me? I looked around, didn't see anybody around me. So I was like, okay, I guess he's talking to me. I pulled the opposite risers. Later on, I found out that there was a guy directly behind me in my blind sight, in my where I couldn't see him, he was getting ready to collide with me, and he was. They wanted us to pull the opposite risers to slip away, and then pull go back to the same risers. Well, all I heard was pull the opposite risers. Didn't see anybody else, so I thought, well, I must be pulling the wrong risers to slow down. So I pulled the opposite risers. Well, that happens to let out the air more and makes you go to the ground faster. Well, that ground came up pretty quick and I didn't realize that. And next thing you know, I blacked out <laughs> as I hit the ground. Mm -hmm. And and next thing you know, I came to as a parachute started dragging me. I happened to have a little size smaller or a little snugger harness than I should have had because it woke me up <laughs> where it was pulling in between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got up, you know, dizzy, concussion, out, you know, everything, tunnel, vision, black and white, but I was able to, you know, to pack my shoes and everything. And the instructor came running out to me and goes, are you okay? Are you okay? And I go, yeah, yeah, I, I can make it. I can walk off. My pride was bothering me. I didn't want my instructor that was over my class to see that I screwed up because <laughs> mm -hmm. he was always going through, well, two, two, three can make it and anybody can make it. <laughs> I had to show him <laughs> that I can get off that drop zone by myself. Well, the instructor that was on the field that came up to me asking if I was all right, showed me a spot about, I think it was 20, 30 feet away, where a little ground where I must have plowed with my Kevlar, my helmet, <laughs> and we were forward. And it was just like dug up a little area. <laughs> that was, I, I walked off that drop zone, dizzy as could be, but I made it. And I asked a friend of mine that when I went to shake our chute before we packed it back again in our bag, I said, keep an eye on me, I might pass out. <laughs> but I made it, I made it through. Yeah. Yes. So um, after that jump, does that pretty much end your time there? Was there a graduation or did you have one Yeah, training? the graduation was kind of interesting, you know. We came there during the, the storm, April showers, I think at the time, and I just at the end of April, and we were leaving with the storm happening at the time during the ceremony, we were indoors at that time. But um, one of the things that was an honor to get was 
but supposedly what now I look back as crazy, but it was called Blood Wings. And there they give you the parachute badge and they not they had pin on parachute badge, but they didn't put the backing on it yet normally you would. So you got these prongs sticking out of the back of these metal of your parachute wings. And it was an honor to supposedly look for your instructor. And I actually did want to get the blood wings from that instructor because I felt I've earned it. <laughs> I went through it the hard way, but I figured I've earned it. And he actually was looking for me because <laughs> he felt honored you know, for me to get it and stuff and make it through. And he told a bunch of guys to uh, stand behind him because I'm still pretty skinny at that time. Mm -hmm. And he went through and just bam, hit him hard, <laughs> hit him right into my chest. Well, you, all you feel is the them hitting your chest. That wasn't so bad. It's pulling them out that you actually feel it. <laughs> but it was, it was one of those silly things as men were pride and something silly, probably harmful, but you had to earn. <laughs> you still had to do, just because of the ceremony wise and stuff. Very good. So you finished um, parachute mm -hmm. training, and you graduated, and then where did you go from there? Um, after I finally came home on leave and stuff, and for a couple of weeks I finally went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where my permanent assignment was supposed to be, my permanent unit. There I was pretty much locked in for four years, but when I first got there, uh, I got sent to 20th Engineers, which was under... Um, Try and think. I can't remember some core battalion that wasn't with the eighty second at that time, but it was another airborne unit. But and we we're supposed to be in twenty fifth engineers waiting for guys. Where a lot of people were coming back from te Desert Storm, waiting to go into twenty seventh or thirty seventh engineer unit. Well, a lot of guys that did come back during Desert Storm went on leave for that whole month and stuff before you know so we were waiting to go to that unit about a month into being in that unit i got pulled off and sent over to 82nd um airborne division where they had uh, the holding area where before you get signed to a unit mm -hmm. and i was going there so instead i was shocked that i was going from what i thought an easier unit to be into 82nd airborne division so i knew that i was going in for a rough road mm -hmm. <laughs> way to go but I remember when I was in 20th Engineers, I had worked at an assignment where I was to go help with this remodeling of these offices, these old offices. So I got to put on civilian clothes and go over there and work on, you know, re help putting up interior framing and everything in these buildings. I met this one guy who said he had a surfboard and that was the first time I was close to a beach, being from Illinois for, you know, mm -hmm. First time to really, and I thought, I'd like to learn how to surf. And he said, I got this surfboard I'll give to you for free. And I said, oh, great, you know. He said, it's got a hole in it, but you can patch it up, you know. So I thought, great, I'll do that. During one of my days off, you know, I made it all the way there to the taxi to pick up this surfboard that had a hole in it. And then I thought, yeah, I could probably repair it, you know. But I didn't think it all the way through because I couldn't take a taxi all the way back because they have no way of holding a surfboard. So it's summer. I'm wearing shorts already, long shorts, and some sandals, flip flops, and a tank top. I'm walking back all the way across from one end of Fort Bragg to the other with a surf surfboard in my hand, this big surfboard, yellow surfboard. Of course, everybody's going by and saying, Where's the beach, dude? Where's the surf, dude? <laughs> I'm walking to surfboard. <laughs> Still two hours from a beach. <laughs> kind of looking funny. I got to my permit unit. You know, well, got to the back to the, rec the area where we we're waiting to go. And we towards the end there of that time, when we had to get our bags, get ready to go to our permit unit. I'm setting my surfboard on top of my duffel bag. Everybody's coming by asking me, where are you from, California, Hawaii, or something like that? No, I'm from Illinois. <laughs> Everybody's just shocked <laughs> to hear that. You know, here I am with a surfboard. I'm from Illinois. <laughs> that threw everybody off. But I went to 307 Engineers uh, Bravo Company. It was my first apartment unit that I went into. Mm -hmm. So. And what was your duty there? I was a combat engineer. Um, 
We were in support of a lot of the infantry groups. We were assigned to a certain battalion that we would help out whenever they got sent anywhere. We would go along with them and we did a lot of the work of the infantry where we would um, remove obstacles or anything like that, go on assignments with them. Anytime they run across something, we were to, you know, set up, either set up obstacles to maybe, you know, to redirect the enemy or to blow up obstacles so they can go through, you know, or remove landmines or anything like that. And we had a few practice assignments, like one time we went up to Virginia and practice. We landed, we, interestingly, it was during Christmas time, we got into a helicopter, a Black Hawk helicopter, and flew over some houses and stuff at low altitude a little bit, and got a chance to see Christmas tree lights from decorations from above instead of from the usual in inside the car. That was a great experience there. Landed in someone else's farm backyard field, and went through the woods, and in, we were supposed to set up a, where I was an M60 gunner and I was supposed to draw the enemy fire towards us while the other guys would go into this public, um, I guess, federal owned st uh, dam where electricity was being produced. They were going to set up some fake explosives. Of course, we were told not to bother the civilians working there. I guess before that they had um, tied them up and duct taped them and stuff and you know full mo mode about you know practicing and stuff so it was interesting getting down the bird and going back and flying over watching the Christmas tree lights and stuff at night it was very good but it was pretty fun then I actually later on I guess they saw that I was always bored I was memorized most of the explosive formulas, it was kind of ahead of everybody else about that and was always learning a new job and and so I would they sent me to combat medic course so I could be you know, have a little more experience with first aid, a little more advanced first aid than what normally other guys learn. And I went through it was only a one week long course with a seventy percent passing <laughs> fail rate, you know, 70% fail rate, I should say. People at a lot of times towards the end there would fail the course because they would have mannequins out everywhere and you were practicing the steps and that when you see how to evaluate the casualty, how to go through and do first aid. And if you did anything wrong, that's a slight wrong way of wrapping at something, a slight wrong of in the steps of evaluation that you didn't do right or checking vitals, if you forget to check the vitals of certain things of this mannequin, you were automatically disqualified. Mm -hmm. I went through about a couple times failing it, <laughs> unfortunately. And so they sent me to work as a chaplain assistant for a little bit, you know, to help a chaplain that didn't have a chaplain assistant yet signed to their unit. Mm -hmm. So I went and helped him and did that for a little bit. Then next you know, I. I guess it, I'm still being bored, so they sent me to a personnel unit where I got a chance to work as a 74 Fox with data processing. Mm -hmm. And that was all on the job training. I never went through school to learn it. Mm -hmm. But while I was there, they sent me to to a combat medic course to learn. Well, I didn't tell them my past experience of failing <laughs> two times. So at that time, they moved the course up to two weeks and a little extra stuff because they wanted people to follow me, you know, and spend more time learning mm -hmm. so they can pass, mm -hmm. have better percentage of passing. I went through with flying colors. I've already been through so much and I knew what I was doing. I remember the, stru the instructors at the very last phase where I've always seemed to fail mm -hmm. were going, oh, you should have been a medic, you should have been a medic. <laughs> like They didn't realize I had plenty of experience trying to get through it <laughs> and stuff. Got back to my unit, went before my first sergeant to show that I passed and stuff, and he was like congratulating me, saying, nobody's passed in a whole week, you know, and they are all giving me praise, patting the back and stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell him that. I, <laughs> I've already been through it a couple of times, felt like, <laughs> and stuff. I took the praises at that time. Mm -hmm. But I, my job on, while I was there was, you know, working with the information from each of the battalion headquarters 
about whenever a person moves from one unit to another or whenever different assignments you know for each guy gets sent somewhere they had this big official zippers computer they, they would um, keep track of where everybody is and I was to get all this data on a big five inch floppy the old computers a big 286 big computer boxes that we were to put together and send it up to um, somewhere on base where they sent it to Huntsville, Alabama where the main headquarters was and we get back these reports that go back to these battalion headquarters and we were supposed to separate them and stuff and this was of the old bubble jet printer so they had you know, these three copies put together and we were to separate them and put made them put them for permanent units to their units that they're supposed to go to and then they come pick it up and we sign off for them and I did it was kind of a boring job but it was a more technical training job mm -hmm. that I enjoyed learning and so and later on I did get placed as a chapel assistant kind of unofficial chapel assistant for that unit because um, the chaplain was forgetting about us we were a small unit mm -hmm. and uh, any time a prayer breakfast or anything like that I was to help get something coordinated to people that want to go to sign them up and stuff or set plenty of pamphlets for people to help with stress or anything else that would help you know just being here for people and stuff to listen you know to help them out while still doing my job I kind of made a mistake though of um, I met the first sergeant's daughter at a Christmas <laughs> party and became good friends and next to you know I was dating the first sergeant's daughter of my unit <laughs> so I got at the time I was keeping a low profile just working hard to figure my work would always be what shows you know how and not trying to just well uh, had a lot of talks from the first sergeant got really recognized from one of the unit <laughs> but good thing we left on friendly terms and <laughs> we didn't last as long <laughs> but yeah that's my first experience with unfortunately the politics of military <laughs> sure so, so um, um, well why don't you go on is there more did you have more or are you getting toward the end of your service or yeah I was getting towards the end of my service um, we had maybe one we had like at the time you know never went overseas for desert storm because everybody's coming back Bosnia unit was going on we had just a small amount of unit policing over there at the time and then we had like a Hades that kicked off and Hades was the first time uh, I experienced a lockdown and one of my job tasks was that we would go out to the airport where everybody's getting on the plane and we, our job was to get the manifest for who's getting on what plane and going over and flying you know getting ready for a jump a lot of times um, we did this for big jumps or the whole ASEC is jumping and going through a, a maneuvers and stuff we would be there to get from these battalion headquarters and manifest on paper the names of the people who was on what plane and we were to type this into a computer well actually I had got signed to the first battalion and we were the only ones doing that part the rest of the guys had their had the guys that were all together good first battalion second second and third battalion would know what to do they would have it on a computer on a floppy or tape bring it up to us do the corrections and they would load on the plane I got the hardest unit they, the gung-ho <laughs> office that didn't want to correct anything that just want everything on paper and just hand us the paper so we would spend all night calling out social securities to a guy who's working on the typer on the keyboard mm -hmm. and it would key in all the social security numbers and would have to find corrections and would have to try to find who they might have thought was they were putting on there because they wouldn't put real good social security numbers sometimes they put in fake names just to fill in a SWAT <laughs> and we kind of found that out the hard way as we were putting these in and stuff so it made it very interesting I love all-nighters doing that <laughs> but it was interesting and then being at the time when I got this specialist I my assignment was to go to the, back to the town 
headquarters and faced his, I think it was a sergeant first class, and say, I need the names here, I need this, this is wrong, this is that. And of course, he didn't like corrections, especially from a specialist. <laughs> so I had to talk with respect to him to get those out, mm -hmm. but it never really worked too well <laughs> at times. But it was very interesting. <laughs> So um, then, uh, how did uh, how did your service end? How um, how did that happen? Or um, when you're coming to the end of your contract, I assume, yeah. and and that um, about six months out, um, I was in the process at that time of you know I had orders come down to if I wanted to officially change my MOS to go to schooling for the MOS I was working at the time. Then also I was in the midst, I went through that year, I went through a promotional board where I've had all the requirements for as a combat engineer to become an NCO. Mm -hmm. I had all the points and everything and I went through a interview board and I, I forgot to say that before that interview board I went through soldier to muck board several times, but never got soldier to muck board. And now it's like you go through, go before people, these um, high-ranking NCOs, and you answer questions about different things of your job and stuff. And you're supposed to be in class A's and everything. And there, they were grade you, and whoever wins that board got soldier to muck board, got to have a few days leave and and recognize through award or certificate. Well, that gave me a plenty of practice that when I went through for my, to go up for E5 to a sergeant, that that would help me with that experience of going before that promotional board. Well, I made sure to ask anybody that came out ahead of me what questions were, try to get ready for the answer and everything. So I went through there. I remember I slammed on that door like I was used to. And these are interior doors were pretty hollow, so they really made loud noise. I found out later that a lot of them jumped <laughs> inside there. Went through, answered all the questions perfectly. Got asked this one question that would throw me, they were supposed to throw me off and see how we react. They said, if you're in the middle of a, they were named as area, that was all dirt. We were two hours from the beach. They said, and you saw a ship come up to you. <laughs> a big, Air, um, boat, you know, they were talking about. I was like, what do you do? I was like, you know, they said, you're on guard. I said, well, I said, one, I checked to make sure of what was in my canteen before. Because <laughs> they see something like that in the middle of the forest. And then I was supposed to say, I challenge password or something. And I was kind of kind of doing it in a joking way. And they were all cracking up laughing. But it was showing that I was knew how, to, what it was they're getting was, how do I react to a silly question? <laughs> how do I react to that? And I end up with 199.5 out of 200, what my score was. So I had a good score. I ended up even beating a lot of the guys out that were going for their E6, mm -hmm. you know, staff sergeant. You know, I had the highest score, but that was, but I never got a chance to go through the schooling to get my rank up, you know because I was so close and they wanted to recruit me, they wanted me to re-enlist and keep going. But I thought, uh, I'm ready to go for civilian life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought I'd go, go back home and mm -hmm. go, go to school and stuff like that. But unfortunately, I also had a stubborn NCO, NCO that was head over me, and he only gave me like a couple weeks to process out. So that was really tough. I didn't really find out all my uh, benefits for getting out, and I didn't get all my copies I was supposed to get and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just got the very minimum of the processing out and stuff to get out. So it was pretty rough. <laughs> I was able to make it out. So you're, you're out, and mm -hmm. do you go home? Yes. Okay. And what did you do um, once you were out? What kind of... Um, uh, job did you find or oh. that type of thing? When I first got out, um, I was looking around for a job and stuff and 
And I went to the unemployment office. I remember looking around, trying to find what's opening. And I remember they were asking me if I want unemployment. And I was like, nah, I'm going to find a job. <laughs> it was a certain pride thing about it. I never collected unemployment before. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to start at the time. And so I turned around and uh, my dad that I was staying with at the time had found me, gave me, was able to find me a job with Sears. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was just temporary, but it was at least a good way to get my foot in the door and get mm -hmm. something working. So I worked at Sears, just where I was helping them set up displays, helping them rearrange aisles and stuff like that. And but I still had a lot of military, you know, words that were in my vocabulary, and one of them was "whoa." You know, every time someone would tell me something, order-wise, if I was in a second or born division. You're known as high speed, you know, person to say who and just go on with the job. It means mm -hmm. copy. I got it. Mm -hmm. I receive it. I understand it. Mm -hmm. I'll do. The, I'm on the job. <laughs> you know. Well, I said that to my boss a lot of times without thinking. He would tell me he asked me to do something, and I go who, and then he heard that sound, and he'd go well. Then he'd repeat what he just told me to say. I realized later on that what I was doing, and he thought I was saying, huh, in a funny way. <laughs> it would repeat everything. Uh -huh. Took me a while to break me of that. It did. And I mentioned after all those jumps I did, being in the ASIC and Airborne Division, going through all those jumps, just I had flashbacks that if I heard diesel or something like that, or a lot of times we had diesel trucks picking us up, go jumps. I would have a flashback of those experiences and stuff and, the, and just the smell and everything. It felt like I was there. So it took me a while to get over that <laughs> and stuff. Cool. Well, what is the, the, the most positive thing, the one most positive thing that you took away from your experience in the service? Um, learning to confront fears, learning to confront uh, tough things mm -hmm. in life and learning to be honest with myself um, through my Christian walk and stuff. That unfortunately, you know, I would fall back on, had to fall back on and go through that experience again. Mm -hmm. There's many milestones just that I could look back on and I wish that stayed more solid on. Mm -hmm. That I will repeatedly now as I'm learning as an adult more and as you get older and stuff and you reflect back, you realize what was more important. What did you what was the big picture of what you learned? And you become more grateful for the little things in life more. You become less materialistic. And when you're in the army and you're out in the field and you're doing something for your country, there's things you learn to respect better, you know, your family. Um, your country, uh, just for what little you have and stuff. And now I, I go back on that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, for sharing mm -hmm. your story, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to do this. Mm -hmm.